All right, guys, welcome back to the podcast. Today we have a wonderful guest. Uh, please welcome Dr. Lauren Young. She's here to share her story about how she started her practice. And um, we actually met. I for, Actually, I forget how we met. I think so. Dr. Lauren or Dr. Young is on the board of a professional affairs committee she's a board director on that or i guess you can say the official title i'm still learning how all that jargon works but she's on the board for the professional affairs committee for the aanp um she had reached out to me a couple months ago now um kind of looking to collaborate because they're working on a really great um product uh focused around business and naturopathic business models and um and so that's how we met. And I heard her story. We, I think our first phone call, we spent what, like an hour on the phone there, just chatting it up. Yeah. And, uh, and her story was incredible. And what she's built is incredible. And uh, she actually convinced me to join the committee. So now I'm on the professional affairs committee for the ANP and uh, slowly integrating into that learning all, you know, the things that they do. Um, but I had to have her on and 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 so she's here now and today we're going to just talk about her story and get to know her a little bit better but Dr. Young I'd I'd love for you to introduce yourself and kind of yeah let's let's start out from the beginning. Oh awesome. Thank you so much for having me. It's um incredibly uh, flattering and I'm honored to to be able to share my story because you know it's one of those things where I mean the, you guys don't get to see, I just gave you a nice little tour of a, my, I call this place my firstborn, my practice, right? Because this is your baby and you have to nurture it. And so it's so fun to share the, the journey you go down and the highs and lows that you have through the whole thing. So um, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to chat about it. So I started uh, my practice after I, I went to Bastyr for a, a minute and then UB got uh, accredited and I was excited to go to the University of Bridgeport because I'm from Connecticut. So I came back to this area for most of my education. And, um, you know, when you're in school, you don't necessarily, you can't see past a lot of stuff, right? You're like so focused on the, the carrot that's dangling in front of you. So I remember being in school and like taking you know taking the practice management paying attention to all of that and then like really couldn't even wrap my mind around it just knew I loved this medicine and wanted to bring it to my community uh and so I studied with doctors that I I liked clinically but I didn't really study with anyone that I wanted to focus on their business plan and got out of school um as we do what, and what, do you mind me asking what what year did you graduate from Bridgeport uh, 2007. So uh, because I was an in-betweeny coming from Bastyr, I graduated by myself in January. Um, so I ended up, you know, you get out of school, you're going to sit for your boards and like, then you're starting to look at your job opportunities. And at the time in 2007, there were not a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I actually took a job with Pfizer, uh, doing consulting work, um, on managing databases and helping with research because there wasn't, there were no jobs in Connecticut for a naturopathic physician. How'd you land um, that with the conventional, more conventional yeah, establishment? I, um, I had a lot of nerdy engineer friends, so I knew computers enough. And I like, so I basically said like, look, I'm a, I'm a doctor, but I, um, I understand research. I'm professional and I understand computers really well. And so I, I don't know, it was, it was a lucky, lucky job to land into. It was really, honestly, it served me so well. I want everyone who works with me knows I love Excel. I love Excel. I love mm -hmm. making formulas. I love making weird spreadsheets and like doing all sorts of fun things. And it serves me well because I can pull a lot of data from my data, my EMR to help me kind of critically look at what my practice is doing and, and kind of think critically about how to support it and that type of stuff. So I had a year of working uh, there and sitting in a cubicle, like doing uh, not a protocol ear acupuncture on my colleagues during lunch breaks and really missing the medicine, um, but liking a paycheck. And then a job opening opened up and I was like, oh my gosh, I get to go do my medicine. This is so exciting. And I applied and um, and got it and it was great. I was going to be covering a maternity leave, but like I had like several months to kind of orient and, um, every 
every position is a little different. This one was great in that it, I had to learn how to set myself up um, on every level. So I did a lot of my own marketing. I, um, I worked probably six days a week and I did my own credentialing. I set myself up on the insurance company. So I learned how to build my practice from scratch because they had me do every, every aspect of it. I was even posting. So in Connecticut, we should back up for people who aren't used to the scope here. We have a poor scope of practice in that we um, cannot do any prescriptions, no injectables, no procedures really other than body work. Um, we do have acupuncture, which is unique um, that we have that and not other things. So, um, but we can order labs and we can order imaging and we are, uh, we are covered by most insurances at this point, basically everything but Medicare. So, um, you know, learning that whole system is like, it's in and of itself a, a workout. And it's definitely some of the stuff we're trying to put into the Thrive Toolkit for the AMP so that we can just do like one-on-one of how to get set up with insurance companies. Cause that's all the stuff I had to do, but I but we got handed the basic resources to do it. So Wait, real um, quick, when did uh, Connecticut start uh, allowing naturopaths to be incorporated in the insurance model? Like, was that because it sounded like you started out straight from the beginning insurance, but is that unique? How, um, so, do you, yeah, yeah, so I don't know how long it's it was most of the time that I've been practicing. Um, and we have the oldest law on the books, basically, when all the other laws had gone away for naturopaths, like Connecticut just didn't bother getting rid of their naturopathic oh, law. So, okay, we been around for for like a long time. I know that um, when I in 2009 or eight or nine, I was the first naturopath to be on Aetna properly because of, um, we're allowed to say company names and stuff, right? Yeah. Well, because yeah. Um, they had, there was one naturopath who had like been credentialed with Aetna by accident as an MD. And so they, uh, they, there was like one natural in all of Connecticut that could be seen by Aetna patients. And so we can jump to where I, uh, that's when I, once I, I leave my first job and I go out on my own, um, I, I had some help getting on to Aetna and we kind of busted those doors open, which was awesome. And that's what it means. Like knowing someone on the inside and like talking to people and get like pushing on, on every possible like aspect of the door till you like unlock it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we, we got Aetna, which was awesome. Um, and, and, Last year we got Medicaid, which was also awesome. So um, that was a huge win for us. Wow. Yeah. So as an associate, I was learning my own marketing. I was um, learning my patient care. I was, um, you know, juggling a lot of things, and it was great. Um, it's interesting that like when you're in that spot, you don't get to focus as much on your clinical, and you have to focus on all the marketing and then you do the basics, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, it's, it's important to kind of build the balance of those two things. And I'll kind of talk about how I do that with my clinicians here. Um, but so that was my first year. It was like a boot camp of like everything business, how to market. I was doing one to two lectures a week. I, I picked up a local magazine and I was doing a monthly column in it. Um, you know, if I was driving to work and I had a bit of a commute and I would listen to the radio, if they were talking about something natural, I would call in and be a cameo on the radio. I would do like everything I could to put my name out there. Right? Wow. Um, I, and, I just want to acknowledge that already, like right from the beginning, from getting your Pfizer job, like you're ready, you're the go-getter. Like just from that alone, just saying like you found your way into that. And like, as a naturopath, it's like, I could just tell you're just a, that personality type that's just like, all right, let's get in. Like, you're going to make it happen or you're going to try your absolute hardest to make it happen. So I, I no, love that. It's thanks. I, you know, I was, I joke, like, I like, I've been since I was a little kid, right? I was the kid who's like, they would go, don't do that. And I'd be like, I'm going to, or I don't think you can do that. And then I'd go do it, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, my, my existential crisis right now is I'm really looking for like what I can't do next. Cause I want to take it on, you know, mm -hmm. um, cause I like the challenge of it. You know, I like being the underdog. I don't mind this at all. I, I, I think it's one of those things where you flip it on your head, its head and like really lean into like, all right, it's a challenge. You know, it's not, it's not a problem. It's a challenge and you can, you'll feel great. Like the, the confidence you get as you start to have little wins really builds on itself, you know? Yeah. And I, and I get it. Cause I, I got out of school and I was like, I have no idea. And I was, 
you know, happy to have a job in a cubicle and health insurance and the rest of it. So, so yeah, so I, I was an associate for a year um, and covered maternity leave and like, and learned a ton. Um, and we, after that, like it was a really long commute that I was doing to get to this job. And it was also like um, a point where I felt like it was time to go out on my own. So I wasn't really prepared for that at all. And so I just kind of had six weeks to kind of come up with a budget, a plan, a place to practice. And um, so one thing that I would highly recommend that was incredibly helpful for me was we have resources in the nutraceutical companies. And so like, I'm not plugging anyone in particular right now, but like, so when I knew I was ready to go out on my own or was gonna have to figure out my own space, um, a couple of the, the reps took me out to lunch and were like, here's some resources, here are some allies, here are some other places you could probably get rent and here are some other ways you could probably, um, you know, opportunities. And so um, they introduced me to a GI doctor that was super into probiotics and wanted to have his own line of probiotics. So I um, moonlighted out of his office three days a week and sold his probiotics as like, uh, like in like helped them develop products. And that's, that was our arrangement. So it was rent free. It was awesome. Oh, nice. And, yeah. And then, so with that setup, then I also set up with a two chiropractors who also did acupuncture in a similar setup, where it's like, look, you can make the money off my dispensary. I'm not going to, which felt good in the beginning, especially because you have to work towards feeling okay with making money on supplements. And I wasn't there yet anyway. So I, I basically had no rent um, and I moonlighted out of these two offices for a year, um, which was great because they wanted to see me busy because then I was like selling their products or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And it also let me like focus on the clinical a little bit more and also just like my brand, what did I want my business to look like, you know, design business cards, that kind of fun stuff. Um, so I did that for a year um, and then what happens is that like they were, I, they had staff and the staff was super helpful. Um, but, um, in both offices, there was people stealing, um, from the doctors. And so, uh, I'm sure some of that happened to me too. I did not decide to go after anyone or do any kind of forensics around it. Um, I just, the, between the, the instances of stealing in the front offices and not having any of my own staff or my own space, it was like, you know, you're like, living out of a suitcase, practicing medicine, I decided to consolidate and like bite the bullet and like hire an employee and like start and get a rent and like do the thing that like is, is stressful. But I did have that year of like floating, building my patient base with a lot of, not a lot of overhead. And so. And were you um, still in insurance at that point too, right? You're, you're at that point, you're working with insurance. So yeah, I had to learn how to jump off of one person's um, contracts and do my own. Yep. Do your own. And okay. So I jumped and did that. And so I was credentialed at the two locations and that the GI doctor, his office manager is a lovely woman. And she was like, you know, he would refer patients to me and then they'd be like, oh, Aetna doesn't cover it. And that's where like, she was like, well, I'm calling so-and-so at Aetna. We're getting you credentialed. This is ridiculous. And sh she made it happen. Like, wow. so we just kept making it, pushing through. So, um, that was incredibly helpful, obviously, for all the naturopaths in Connecticut. This, we will a lot to this woman, Karen, who is lovely. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, and so billing insurance is its own creature too, right? So you, I had to do all my own billing at first, and then I hired a company. All right, so you can either have when you're billing insurance, you've got to do a couple different options, right? You've got to pick your EMR and your software and everything. I at the time was using practice fusion because it was free and it was web-based so I could have it at both offices. And then I hired an, I outsourced it to um, a uh, company that was the GI doctor was also using. And so when you outsource your, ins um, your insurance billing, typically they do a percentage of what you collect. And that percentage is based off of the income that you're going to bring in. So for example, if you're going to see 200 charges or 200 patients a month um that means that's 200 claims that they have to manage and if like that brings in whatever 15 grand 
you're going to, they're going to ask for a higher percentage of that um, because it's not a ton of claims versus like the GI doctor would get paid like what, like two grand per colonoscopy, endoscopy, and they do 10 every morning. So he made 20 grand before he showed up at the office, you know? So yeah. his, his rate was substantially lower. So I think the average primary care outsourcing, give or take, I don't, no one quote me on this, but like, I think it's around seven to 8% the last time I had looked at it, which is I do in-house billing now. And um, the GI doctor was getting 4% at the time. This is again, probably 15 years ago. So please no one think that that's still the rates. I don't know what they are. But um, they had never heard of a naturopath before when I had someone doing the outsourcing the billing for me. So they're like, you're a specialist, right? I was like, yeah, I'm a specialist, like the GI doctor. They're like, okay, we'll give you his rate. And so they gave me 4% rate, which was obscenely awesome, right? Because that is much. So basically they collect your money and there's pros and cons to this. You don't have to get your hands dirty with any of it. They bill out everything. They do all of it, but they also don't understand naturopathic medicine and they don't really care about that like last 10 percent uh as far as you know making sure every claim is goes through properly and that kind of stuff so and then you're not involved in the billing in the same way you code and then you call it a day and you don't like evolve your knowledge of billing and coding and that can really help build an insurance-based practice so um it was great in the beginning because i didn't i had too much going on but now i'm I'm definitely an advocate of having the billing in house. I like it a lot better. You can control the customer service. You can, you know, be mindful of like, oh, we knew we need to raise the rate on this because the insurance company reimbursed hundred percent of it or whatever. And it makes you kind of put some intention towards your billing. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, so I, I set up my own, uh, it was an old Victorian house. I, um, put up my shingles, like a big deal. And, you know, on eight, nine, 10, I opened up my doors and that was like the, the big deal is like I, my biggest investment was my um, point of sale system that was going to take credit cards and that kind of stuff. Um, it was, it's, um, it was a QuickBooks point of sale that's actually expiring and they're no longer using it anymore. Um, but it was like $1,500, which at the time I was like couch surfing and like, <laughs> yeah. being like, you know, like no money and no budget. It was a big deal, but um it was, yeah, it was a, it was a good investment because it helped scale with me. Um, I would say that's the one thing is like, make sure everything you invest in is scalable because you don't know how big you're going to get and you don't want to have that be the limiting factor. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Um, so that was very helpful because it could, um, it removed all the air room for error. Cause you could just like swipe the card and it put the, the amounts were all in the system. It did my dispensary and all my copays and that kind of stuff. I had my, my one employee and me and in that little Victorian house that I was in an area that I was hoping would gentrify. Um, mm-hmm. Spoiler alert, it doesn't. And I had it, <laughs> but it, it was, a uh, we had someone like tased on our front lawn and my car got broken into like in the middle of the day. And, oh, um, yeah, but, it, but you know, patients came and like, you just stay open to everything. So at that point, now it's mine. I got my own business card. I'm on my own. And, uh, you would just say yes to every opportunity you could. So a lot of networking stuff. I never did like the, I did one BNI thing and I wasn't into that kind of networking. I felt, I felt like that. Um, people were just waiting for you to stop talking so they could talk about themselves and a lot of those marketing things, you know, Yeah. but, um, we used to have like some meetups with like other like-minded practitioners. And um, I also would do a lot of like reaching out to pri- referring out to GI doctors, referring out to primary care, referring to all the specialists um, on a regular basis that they understood that I wasn't a threat. I'm working with them. I want them to be evaluated by a rheumatologist or oncologist. And so some really good opportunities came from that. Just like being, staying in my lane as a naturopath and then being okay with like making sure everyone else has a cardiologist and that kind of thing too. I feel like referrals probably have built up a lot of my practice because um, when you find a good GI doctor, one, then your patient's really happy that you're referring to someone that you like and you know. Um, Were you doing anything special with, with those referrals? Like, did you ever meet? those doctors in person did you send them like any 
thank you cards or like what was the or was it just like over time because the amount of traffic you're saying like they knew who you were just based off of that oh so like um you know I, the the GI doctor opened a little bit of doors for me just because I was with him and so that helped a little bit and then but when I I, I was on my own after that when um, I do stuff later on but at that time I probably didn't have the resources or time to so it was just more of like in the treatment plan I I specify you know go follow up with this particular oncologist because he's particularly cool or whatever and so then like one day randomly in my waiting room I come out my like office uh, staff person was like all excited and I was like what's going on and she's like yeah, there's an oncologist in the waiting room looking to talk to you. And you're like, what? you know? Um, and so that was a cool experience where like, I came out and he was just like, you know, I like what you did with this patient. Like you, it's, everything's very evidence-based and it seems like you're, you know, you got this woman to go through getting a, um, you know, lumpectomy when she didn't want to have one at first. And so we talked about it and he's like, I really want to present this case at the hospital. And I was like, Okay, so him and I and the surgeon presented this case of like this woman who wanted to do something, you know, non conventional for her treatment, but we talked her through, you know, the importance of like, you know, reducing the term of burden and all the rest of the stuff, staying in the standard of care and doing naturopathic and keeping her empowered through the whole process, like we, like all the stuff we do, right? Um, and so I got to present that at, at the hospital. That was a cool experience. Um, and it was just because of like, again, like, I think the conventional medical world had some fear around me at first that I was going to de-prescribe, that I was going to do, um, you know, some kind of like, I, even during that one talk on the um, oncology patient, um, they asked, they're like, you know, were you detoxing them? And I'm like, no, I wasn't detoxing them during chemotherapy, you know, like that kind of thing. Like there's a lot of myths about our medicine and that breeds a lot of fear. And so I think like a big part of our marketing ends up being, uh, you know, dispelling myths, you know? Yeah. Uh, so with those networking and just constantly going to any event and staying open to everything, um, I met a compounding pharmacist, now compounding pharmacist and a naturopath in Connecticut literally have no interactions with each other, right? I can't prescribe through them at all, but it was just a nice friendship of like oh you know we'll network and support each other kind of thing um and they would go to a lot of the similar conferences because they were into functional medicine so that's where we would kind of meet so then he introduced me to um a do um who was um you know into functional medicine as well um and as we were talking they were building a residency program for the university of new england um they have a family medicine osteopathic residency program and so he was like real Real quick, I want to because I, I want to ask a question about the when we'll go into the story because this is getting good. But I do want to ask. Um, so with the insurance, uh, I guess one thing I want to make clear because I know in the past it was like, well, if you know, if we if if naturopaths get accepted by insurance, then we'll have our patients fed to us kind of situation. And I, I want to know what was that experience for you? Like was, mm -hmm. you know, were was the insurance part of that marketing for you where you know you were getting patients fed into you or like did it not really have an effect on the amount of patients you were you were getting in and was it really the majority of it coming from your own like efforts majority comes from your own efforts here's why insurance i'm passionate about taking insurance though so let's let's uh that's a really good point um so once in a while on my intake would say like yeah they found me on the cigna website or whatever um but there are so many opportunities when you take insurance the the barrier is much lower right like if all they have to do is pay a copay to see what you're about that's a lot less than having to like win them over and do the the meet and greet thing or whatever, which I did do, I should say my, my first year in, when I was an associate, I did meet and greets for 15 minutes for free. And then they could decide whether or not they wanted to be patients. And, um, but I, I got rid of that fairly quickly just because it ended up being like a, if you want to see me, it's a copay, you can do this, you know? Um, so I would say insurance shows conventional medicine that we're just as good it's not like we're not you know having to like we're it's validates us to be take insurance um on a lot of levels like it's it's a lot easier to talk to a gi doctor and be like 
well, Aetna thinks I'm worth it and Anthem thinks I'm worth it. And, you know, the state of Connecticut, Medicaid thinks I'm worth it. So that, that validates us in that world a lot. Yeah, um, I like and, that. and then it also, um, you know, it does allow patients to be able to see you easier. They want to see that you're in network that always like, for whatever reason, is this great thing. Um, I would say all along about 20% of my patient base is still cash. Just either they have a high deductible and they would rather pay cash or they had Medicare or a plan that didn't cover because some plans still underwrite out naturopaths. Um, now, now, does the does the insurance though like affect what you're able to charge? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, well, and so oh. and I imagine that's a con, right? Like that's a con to working with insurance because essentially they could, you know, they can they're they're establishing your rate. Right yes. or is correct? Yes. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, do you have, you know, what you're allowed to bill the insurance is dependent on the insurance because they're essentially making that rate. But you also have cash options, right? So you have you said twenty percent of your patients is cash. Are are those prices different for you know, or are they? Are you do you try to line them up with what insurance? So here's what you have to do. So here's how it goes. So, it, and I, you do kind of want to line it up with insurance because then the model matches because otherwise like you can't do like two hour appointments with your cash patients and then hour appointments with your insurance patients or whatever kind of thing. So you, you want to make it all like as close to similar as possible. And from my perspective, if I'm, if I'm set up to make this much off the insurance company and that's more work than someone who's just wants to write me a check, then I, um, no one writes checks anymore, but you know what I mean? But like, yeah. uh, so I felt like it was only fair to charge the prices like I was getting from the fee schedule. So you can bill, I should back up. You can bill $500 an hour. Um, when you credential with an insurance company, they give you a fee schedule. They say like, all right, you want to be on our panel? Cool. Here's what we will pay you for. And here's what we will pay you. And they will give you that cheat. And so that also gives you a lot of creativity um because when you get that fee schedule you can look at all these codes and go oh i can do all these other things too that can get little ancillary tuck-ins to get extra money so if you do an ekg if you do a pregnancy test if you um you know hydro hydrogen methane breath breath testing um there's lots of other little tests and things you can add in that are on your fee schedule that you don't know about. So it's just about learning how to code what you're doing. If you do a screening for anxiety and depression, and I think people should do those on a regular, especially the past few years, it's an extra nine bucks. Is it like, is, you just build it into your template. So it's a little extra you add to every appointment. So yes, the actual office visit is not a like insanely great rate. Um, the rate varies. Um, the worst ones would be like the state insurance, the Medicaid's and the um, there's a couple of insurance companies that are lousy that are probably like in the $60 range for a follow-up visit. And then there's ones as high as like high, like 180 for a follow-up. So the range is huge from that perspective, but it's all those other little things that you can add in that the insurance company is happy to pay that you wouldn't do with a cash patient, right? You're not going to upsell them for having them fill out a questionnaire on their anxiety, but mm -hmm. sure. If it makes clinical sense with an insurance company, you know. So that's um, where that's where um that's where knowing about how to bill comes into handy because then you'll be able to see like all the things that you could potentially be missing in that appointment to add as a, an additional like cost, right? Like because you're making you're making your money from yes, the appointment, but the add-ons involved in that appointment, which is which would take yeah. some understanding of like the billing process. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I did a class for, uh, NMSA on basics of billing and, um, actually Profact is talking us into putting it online. So that'll be up there soon, but I want to do another one, um, with another colleague of mine in Connecticut on just all those little other things that you can be billing for. And it's varies by, um, your fee schedule. And so that's another thing to know is that like, like for example, Medicaid uh, recognizes us as specialists. So they don't let us do, um, gyne exams or physical medicine. So there's just things to be mindful of, cause then you'll build the insurance and they'll say it's denied. And then mm -hmm. you have a choice to, 
if it's not Medicaid, you have the choice to build a patient for it or not. But yeah, there's a lot of like nuances to the codes and little things that you can add in. And it's work if you're doing it manually, but if you build it into the templates and stuff, it's easy ways to add a little extra here and there. Now, um, so overall though, you'd say you're on the side of insurance, like out of, cause there's pros and cons to it, but the pros outweigh the cons in your opinion. Is, is that correct? I am very pro insurance because I feel like my goals with this medicine is accessibility and sustainability. And I, I it's so much more accessible and sustainable. Um, and my associates, I mean, we get to see a lot more patients because we're taking insurance, right? Because we have to first, I guess. And then also we get to because the volume is is easier to create. So the average doctor in my office is seeing 50 patients a week. And um, so just think about how much you, more you learn clinically because you're learning with your patients. That's why it's yeah. the art of medicine, right? So then we're seeing so much more pathology and interesting cases and unique things. And um, and so I think that I'm really proud of my clinicians because they're all awesome, but they're also like really seasoned, even if they're only a few years out in school, we're all, we've seen a lot of stuff, you know? Um, now with, cause, cause here's the, does, so that's 50 patients a week. You know, a lot of, a lot of traditional naturopaths argue against insurance because it, 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 it you know, it affects quality of care. Like, have you seen that to be, cause here's the thing is like in order for, for in some cases, in order to be successful financially, you need the volume, right? Because insurance is setting the bills or setting the price range. Have you seen that to be the case where it's affected your quality of care or have you have you maintained your quality of care? And like, yeah, what does that look like? I guess, like how long are your appointments? And Yeah, so the first appointments are an hour, follow-ups are 30 minutes. Occasionally we'll drop it down to like a 15, if you just 15 minutes, if you're just doing a check-in on someone's like, response to a low dose immunotherapy or something like that. Um, so there have been some things that have affected quality. We should talk about that, but I would not say it's been the volume. I think the thing that can um, happen with volume is burnout and there's mm -hmm. ways to mitigate burnout, which is like the hot topic everywhere. Right. I, yeah. I have ideas about that too. Um, but I think that um, I think the model works better because you've seen the patient more frequently and they cannot drink from a fire hydrant every time they see you and have these crazy treatment plans and review of findings and all this stuff and go over nutrition. It's too much all at once. So having smaller visits more frequently, I think, so the, the patients are just out the gate, understand that that's the game plan um, that you would say like, okay, our first appointment is an hour. We're going to do a follow-up in three weeks to go over just nutrition. And then I want to, when you get your labs back, we're going to have a follow-up to go over those. And that's when I'll give you more of a treatment plan based off of my concerns with this, that, and the other based off the labs. So you kind of create a dance with the whole thing. I like um, that. Or, I like that. It, it's it, also, you, yeah. you, you're breaking up like the, um, yeah, because I feel like a lot of people get trapped in that. Because what's happening with the conventional model is that there's not enough time and the doctor's trying to tackle the patient's entire history in five minutes, 10 minutes or whatever. And it's like, well, for us, we treat the cause. We're very like thorough. And why not take it in micro bursts, right? Starting from the beginning and then you're able to do it over time, right? Because that's the one factor that you have control of is like, you know, what you're getting into at each appointment like you don't have to tackle the entire thing all in one 15 30 minute session so that's an interesting perspective that i haven't really like yeah thought about is like you could take it at your own speed even at in shorter yeah. increments though yeah what well, and also like um you know the when you talk when you talk about making goals for patients like lifestyle goals you want them to be the classic smart like right like specific measurable attainable realistic timely so they need to have little chunks and more accountability. So actually what we're doing now in piloting are group visits where we see um, the max was 10, that was too many for us. We're aiming for sweet spot of eight patients at a time all at once to see them more frequently for a lower code office visit to hold them even more accountable for the people who really need the handholding, but we're not a concierge medicine practice. So we're not doing it you know, I don't want to be like texting with patients. So um, I think the more frequent, 
shorter visits have really served everyone well. It's like, you know, having bites of lasagna instead of a whole sheet pan. And it, it builds more of a relationship with people. I also think, you know, if someone's starting out and they're doing insurance, finding some other kind of service for people. So there's, Nutrition visits uh, probably have the highest no-show rate, right? Because like, if you did a nutrition visit, you don't want to get told not to eat sugar anymore, right? So you, that that's the one that like people are going to want to back out of. People are going to show up when they want to hear about their lab work or their treatment plan. When they're given something, they need support. They're scared. They don't feel good. Whatever else is going on, anywhere they can show up and receive support. So the labs validation is a huge piece of it. But then there's also um, body work or acupuncture or anything where they're just going to get show up and then they get taken care of is like a really great addition because then it helps them feel empowered to do the work of changing their diet or making some exercise goals or whatever else you're working on. And so, um, I, you know, your background, like, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, um, interest in, from the community in having therapies where they can just show up and get taken care of for a little bit. Um, so adding something like that into your practice pretty quickly is also another really um, highly desirable. And if it's something covered by insurance, even better. So I really like um, osteopathic manipulation and craniosacral therapy are um, are both usually covered by a lot of insurance companies and a great way for someone to like come in, relax, be taken care of a little bit, and it's still getting covered by their insurance, which is cool too. That's why craniosacral therapy is covered by insurance. As an osteopathic manipulation, yeah. And wow. That's, yeah. 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 That's interesting. Um. Okay. Yeah. No. That was that was a great tangent on insurance. I, yeah. I my uh, I know. and we'll we'll get back to the the yeah. next part of your story. But last thing is what because I feel like I you know there's a constant battle between should we accept insurance should we not should we, what's been the biggest thing that people that makes people opposed uh to taking insurance like what's the one thing you've heard over and over again and then like what's your i guess rebuttal to it you know right, like you the like know your worth you know the insurance companies don't pay us enough i'll tell you no physician is happy with how we're paid by insurance companies but for me if I, I, and I would highly recommend this for anyone building their practice is to like create your core values and make your decisions off those core values. Hands down, one of the best things I've ever done, because it makes the decision-making so much faster and easier. Cause you're like aligned, not aligned next. You know what I mean? Um, and so for me, the core values were like service and empowering patients and accessibility and sustainability, which means I have to take insurance. Like I, I easily could have a cash practice easily. Um, but I, I think knowing my worth means knowing that I can play on the same field as other medicine, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, I feel very valued. I feel like I, I have worth and I don't feel like I'm being cheated. I think it's just a matter of, um, being creative with the system that's there, you know? Yeah. 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 Which actually, so getting into the next phase of your journey here, you were mentioning you ended up meeting a DO. Um, yes. Oh, yes. I got I got involved with the residency program. And so these poor medical uh, students had me for like two hours or I brought in speakers. I brought in a lot of speakers. These guys were lucky, actually. And I had spoke like it was like Wednesday even at, at evenings from like four to six. I taught them different topics and. Um, and not, not that I was trying to make these family medicine doctors, naturopaths, they didn't want to be, but you know, I was like, here's a two hour lecture on fish oil. You guys will appreciate why we recommend fish oil, you know, that kind of stuff, which was really cool. Um, so that was a great experience. And from there, they, um, would also rotate in my office. Um, so at this point I moved out of the, the crummy Victorian that was leaking and not safe. And, uh, I had moved down the street um, to the um, place I'm at now. Um, I was renting out one suite of it. And um, I had brought on a couple of associates at that point. Um, no, and so they, what? Sorry, I, I was going to ask you, um, Dias, how did you make the connection with where you were giving these talks to DOs? Like what, what 
what was the role there? Were you a, a teacher at a, somewhere or? I, I was brought on as faculty and um, we were building the curriculum essentially for the family medicine program. And it's all because of this one doc that I met from like, you know, meeting a compounding pharmacist. And like I said, like the direct connection of a compounding pharmacist and I are like, there's nothing to benefit my business from being friends with a compounding pharmacist other than like-minded, have the same values, focusing on that piece of things. And that's when he introduced me to this DO who's like, oh, by the way, I'm a residency director. I like what you're saying. Would you teach my students this? And I was like, okay. And so we built out of um, a, you know, curriculum around that. And um, it is, he is retired from that position now and it's different residency directors. So I pretty much do like I'm, I'm here for rotations. And then I do like probably three or four lectures a year. It's not what it used to be. Um, but that's good. Cause I don't think I could sustain that anyways. Um, so, um, all that to say the students would rotate through my clinic and they would also have to sit through lectures from me. So, um, I've charmed a couple and they would, they basically after residency, they joined the clinic, um, as physicians here. So we have, now um five primary care um dos and aprns and um and then also a bunch of nds um so i think one of the other things i think that's really grown my practice is once you're in a place that you can take students um i know a lot of people are worried about the relationship with your patient and the experience the patient will have you don't have to have every patient be seen with a student, but accepting students, um, I think is a responsibility we have to naturopathic uh, community, but also to medicine in general, because even if they're APRN students, they're going to see what a naturopath does and they're going to have those cases that clearly need us. And then they know to refer to us. And like every, every doctor we meet or every conventional medicine provider we meet, we're, we're, dispelling myths and educating and then under, having them understand like no we're we're all on the same team you know that kind of yeah. thing yeah i feel like that it's it's so important to socialize with these other professionals even at a at a younger stage in their career like residents because i feel like it's so easy to sell our profession right like the fact that mm -hmm. do's want to come and work for you in in mm -hmm. in a primary care setting that's more holistic is like it's because the quality of care is there and their their quality of life is probably better too because of the work that they're doing so it's like i don't know what we do is kind of like an easy sale to these people it's just a matter of getting in front of these students these residents and these other professionals to to understand that you know we we're using evidence based medicine like it's and we're getting great results you know it's funny. So I'm not scared at all at presenting to a room full of hospitalists. I'm not scared of going. I did uh, one talk up in Boston to like all the natural, all the uh, osteopathic physicians in uh, New England is like a big regional one. Um, that's fine. Room full of naturopaths, terrified. <laughs> like, yeah, this, is, <laughs> this is probably making me sweat more than a lot of other lectures would just because um I, we're so unique. We're awesome. We're unicorns. And when people hear us talk, they're like, oh yeah. And like all the primary care here would say like, well, you know, your biochemistry more than we do. We don't, we don't know that as well. We just get like a little bit of it and that's it. So I think like, honest, truly I'm way more intimidated by talking to naturopaths. I don't, I've never, I did one panel discussion for one naturopathic conference and that was about it. I'm not, because I, I don't know. It's because uh, I know how awesome we are and it's intimidating. Yeah, yeah no, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so let's let's talk about this, the scale, scaling of your business, because I, I feel like um, you've come a long way. I, right before we hopped on this pod, you, you gave me a tour of your office. There's 13 patient rooms. You got what is it? How many doctors are in that one office there? Uh, <laughs> you know, I need to count. I think we have a total of 16 <laughs> providers. Yeah, yeah it's, so, it's awesome. It's yeah, nice. and then you and then you have multiple locations, which is incredible too. Yeah. Like, uh, you're honestly doing a lot for the profession over there, on, on the, right? With insurance and 
uh, you know, getting these DOs on board with it. Like that's incredible. But I, I do want to hear, you know, just tell me how you scaled that, right? Like it's, it sounded like you you're in this space now, you have some associates, you've converted the DOs to, to work with you. Um, what did that first team look like? And then how did you kind of just compound? Yeah. So my first associate, I, so I started building a wait list by like 2012. And so my first associate, I pretty much like had a, a solid wait list ready to go for her. Um, and when that, when she came on, like, it was like, you know, um, making sure I was supporting her with that kind of piece of things. And she was like a, she was a mini me. Right. And so what I would do to help build her practice, is she would see the acutes. Um, I would have her do all the nutrition visits. Um, so that does have a higher no-show rate, which sucks, but like, I was still taking care of, you know, but like you do the best you can with that. And, um, and it also allows her to like see my treatment plans and work in that way. So she was the, um, a powerhouse and a great, oh my God, she's been with me over 10 years. She's like a little ND sister. Um, and so she came on and then after that, we added them by twos. So my next two associates came at the same time. So I was, I was, every time I added an associate, I'm always scared. Am I going to keep them busy enough? Always, 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 always. Um, and yet it always fills out, you know? So, um, it helped that one of the doctors did body work. Actually, both of them did some variation of body work so they could build their practice a bit that way. And that's when we started building more niches too. Like, so one likes more infectious disease stuff. One does more cardiovascular stuff. So people started building their, like their interests that way. Um, so there's a lot of referrals within the group as well. So the first, the solid group for a little while was um, for myself and three other NDs. And then, and then we brought on a, a primary care at that point, which was like, it's whole other creature and project. Cause all of a sudden there's like, at that time I didn't have an EKG yet, or honestly a defibrillator and like that kind of stuff. You realize you need to have oxygen in the building and that kind of stuff. So it was a different, because we don't have that scope in Connecticut. It, we were able to be a, a group of four NDs with a very minimalist amount of overhead. And it, it definitely was a jump up bringing on the primary care. Um, and so then from there, um, you know, we were always in one of the keys you saw my, my doc alley, like one of the keys is we always had a space where we would all come together and we would do a lot of, um, we do grand rounds once a month together as a group, we buy dinner and it's, you know, we're all together. Um, and so always having that camaraderie that way has been really helpful to go over cases together. Cause I, I mean, you know, the, the loneliest thing is an Indian solo practice. You're so like you get a weird case, you're like, what the heck do I do with this? Mm -hmm. You know, having some kind of support is really awesome. And like, we just, you know, 2000, like, the early, like 2010 timeframe, I wasn't a lot of support at the time. Yeah. Yeah. My, my question to you for, for that on that specific topic around like building that team, like what ten, for a doc to stick around for 10 years, uh, um, you know, is that, and she was an ND, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like yep. the problem we're having in our profession is, you know, I, I feel like there's a lack of collaboration. Like what's been the main thing to foster that type of relationship with another ND and to help you scale? Like, I mean, now you're at, you know, started out four, it sounds like you have 16 other doctors now that are all like collaborating together. Like, how are you so successful at doing that? You know, how are you getting these people to work together? Um, we have, uh, I mean, one, they, I, I don't ask anyone to do something that I'm not doing at least as much, if not more. Right. So any one of us that are doing whatever we're doing, we're, we're all, we're all in it together. Everyone sees the vision. Again, it's grounding yourself in that vision of being like a center of excellence for this community. It's reminding yourself that this is about service and supporting patients care and coming from like that loving serving place. Um, it making sure you have fun together. We have really good Christmas parties, really good Christmas parties. And like, actually we usually do some kind of retreat last year was we went to, um, and hand the new Hampshire conference and we rented two big beach houses. It has gotten a lot pricier. I won't lie. Cause now it's like how many bedrooms do we have everyone go with their family and like 
take the weekend and have fun together. Play and fun are a great way to like bond and connect. Um, and at this point, like 10 years, we've seen each other through babies and families and loss and marriages. And like right now we have five engagements in the office, you know, like everyone's in there, but it's this community support that really feels great. Um, I think everyone knows that I'm very invested in them. I, I listened to one of your podcasts about like, you know, when you're a new resident or a, a, a residency are a little different because um, residencies aren't based off of their numbers. But like when you're a new associate, be prepared to not make as much money. But like, I feel like my goal is my associates should be making more than those medians that you talked about out the gate, like as soon as possible. We should, my goal is that everyone here is thriving. And I think another way that we've really supported each other is if they have an idea, they know I'm rolling up my sleeves and doing it, you know, which is how we ended up with some of the satellites we did. Like one of the docs is like, I want to live on the coast. And we're like, let's do it, man. Let's, let's make it happen down there. So yeah. I so, think those are key pieces. Yeah. Now with, cause I feel like a lot of the, like the, the stress that's put onto these collaborations is sometimes, or maybe oftentimes is, is financial, right? It's like, like a doctor won't stick around if they can't, if the, you know, they can't put food on their table kind of situation. And sure. so I think one component that plays a part is one knowing when it's time to bring on another physician that you can support, right? Which I'm sure we can kind of dive into that a little bit. Um, but the other piece is like, I imagine you had these doctors also uh, helping you with their, with marketing themselves. Is that, is that correct? Like, Yes. So, I mean, we talked about, I had a, like a article that I would write every month for a local magazine. Um, obviously I didn't do that by myself for 10 years. Like I handed that off or we would rotate and take, I, I don't think of it as marketing. I think of it as community outreach. Like it is, it makes it one so much easier to talk about your medicine passionately and not get fatigued at a, a health fair. If you're going to the health fair, to show up for your community and not just to sell your practice. Like, so mm -hmm. we've always had a level of community outreach. Um, I probably since COVID, it's been a lot less just because I think we all got fatigued for a bit. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, framing it that way makes it feel a lot less exhausting. And so, yes, yeah. they all, and honestly, I don't, I don't, it's just part of the culture that you do that. Like if your patient asks you to speak at a Parkinson's, support group you go for it you know and we've had some like group projects like right now we're doing a podcast that's like our group project right now so like you know some permutation of me and two of the doctors pick a topic and we do that and that's kind of like our little like outreach pro outreach project that I'm kind of like rebuilding us we used to have a thing where when we were on call we'd rotate call and um the week that you're on call, you wrote a blog post too, just to like keep our blog healthy and active and going kind of thing. Um, we also would do things like, um, if you go to a cool conference, you have to come back and kind of share what you learned with the group. Nothing crazy, not like a PowerPoint, but like here are the cool tips and tricks. And so with that, we've, I, I think um, investing in people's evolving careers, um, is really one of the best things I would recommend to any employer. Um, you know, Dr. Pasternak went to Belize, uh, Dr. Edgerton went to India, um, or else Dr. Dr. Berkman went to um, Iowa, but like she had to go study with Terry Walls and like, so they investing in your associates to be able to do really good education because that's gonna keep them passionate. They see that you value them um, and, that's a piece of things that I think keeps us all from burning out is that our careers have been evolving all along. And so we're not bored with our medicine and we're not just sitting there explaining lipids over and over again all day, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I like that reframing that you mentioned around like the marketing versus community outreach. Cause it really is like when you reframe it that way, it goes from I'm doing this for me and the business to I'm doing it for them and my community. Right. And I feel like that is way more energizing than doing something for yourself, you know, and your business. And I, I like that. So I, I, I yeah, I would 
it, 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 it really, it changes the whole energy of how we interact with our community. Like there's this um, health fair at a church. Um, it's a large church and, and it's a very well attended health fair. Um, and it's just got a really fun energy to it. And the doctors will ask, can I do it this year? Like who the heck wants to spend their salary? I'd be like, great. And it's like, you know, but like, it's just a different energy. And then, you know, I, I mean, is it always that way? No, like there's one that we do every other April. They just have a big health fair. Um, but I'm doing them sometimes, some other, but I never have to like, I just say who wants to, and someone picks it up or who wants to do a blog post on this. Or um, we just had a, a company that does mold testing, ask for us to do a blog post. And it's like, yeah, sure. You know, who wants to do it? Someone jumped right on it. So um, we all take care of each other in the community that way. So it, it is a nice way to do that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 On, on, uh, so going back to like bringing on that first associate, just cause I, I do want to touch on this briefly is um where were you at in as far as like the how big your clinic was and what was like the the decision that it was time to bring someone on like what did that look like because the first person you brought on was a naturopath um you know did you have like a waiting list for that naturopath like you had a waiting list for the other you know like what made you say, okay, now it's time to bring on another person? Because I feel like that's an important part too, is like, if you bring someone on too early, then that could kind of like tarnish the relationship a bit because there is going to be like some potentially some difficult times in trying to like build their client base or whatever. Right. So it's like, I feel like that might be a small piece to it, but what was your experience? So I will say too, I brought on an associate before I brought on my like you know, 10 year ND sister. Um, and this person was part time with me, part time going to do their own thing. Cause I was, I was having a volume where like people, I was limiting my new patients. And so there were people who were angry that they couldn't get in for a while. And that was not for follow-ups, but for new patients. And so that was where I was like, I, I'm going to need someone. So, but I was scared, right. Of like not having enough patients for them, not keeping them busy enough. So I brought on this person who was seasoned that I knew who was a wonderful guy. Um, and, but we practice very differently. And so if they came in to see me and they got him and he was a great doctor, we just are different. Uh, it was just not, it was not the same. So I think one of the biggest things I would say is like making sure you have an associate that if you're going to transfer your patient base to an extent to them, they should be an extension of you on some level. Like they have to be similar in how you practice. Like if you do a lot of homeopathy, you should not hire someone who does a lot of like nutraceuticals and a lot of, or if like you're going to do like only nature cure in your practice, then you have, you're flipping around and someone wants, you need to have it somewhat aligned. And then I would say the Venn diagram can overlap a decent amount, but then you want a little overlap that's different. That way they have this uniqueness to their practice that will augment yours. But so I made the decision because the volume and I was nervous about keeping them busy enough for sure. Um, and so was in a place where I like decided, I was like, well, these are the number in my head. I was like, this is how much I can like have as a baseline. So this person can like, move to Connecticut, make the decision to like, you know, can have a, a life and a salary and understand that they can make money as like a base. And then I, after there, I would give them more depending on their volume of patients. Um, and it's, it's always worked. I've always had it work. Like I've, every time I've, I've been nervous about it, like I brought in one doc, she was her whole family from Chicago to join us that's huge. Right. I got to make sure she's busy and doing it. And I was really nervous because we had already had at that point, I think five or six naturopaths or whatever. And like, I was like, well, maybe you can do some phlebotomy on the side. And like, it, you didn't even need to, you didn't need to like, you just, you know, if they have downtime, they're learning a new modality or if they've got downtime, they're, they're all into the practice is the key is like, so, um, the thing I would say is I don't feel like it's a great idea to bring on someone who's part-time with you part-time somewhere else. I think they need to be like invested in your clinic, you know? Yeah. Um, I very rarely call it my clinic. Actually it's, it's our clinic, right? It's like, I, you know, yeah, you but want we, people that, that yeah. have that same vision, right? Like you want, yeah, it's our clinic. Cause it's like, you want people that 
are willing to like grow grow with it like those are the best employees or partners is like people Mm -hmm. that want to kind of reach the same goal and have the same vision kind of thing well no sorry go ahead you want to say one of my one of my proudest moments um was that I, so my goal was to make something bigger than myself. Right. And so like one of my proudest moments this is my brag moment is uh, there was uh, two people, two people showed up at the same time for one of my doctors um, uh, for Dr. Pasternak. We'll, we'll, sp- we'll spell it out for her. Um, and so th- one had canceled, but then like rescheduled and thought she got the same time back. So anyways, we had two new people at the same time here and they were like, who gets to see her? And so the one was already going in with Dr. Pasternak. So there's this other one that's in the waiting room. And she's not happy. So I was like, well, I'll see her. I don't have anything right now. I can, I'll take her kind of thing. And I heard her talking to the front. She's like, who's this Dr. Young? Is she any good? (laughs) And I was like, that's freaking awesome. Like, she doesn't know who I am. She came here for Dr. Pasternak. And like, she's wondering if I'm any good or not. And I was like, that's freaking awesome. Like, I was like, I'm a poor man's Dr. Pasternak today. That's so cool. You know, that is is really cool. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) It's awesome. And it also checked my ego at the door, which was great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's hilarious. Um, I was going to ask you, now Now, when these doctors are starting on with you, I know you mentioned something like salary. Are, are they coming on as an employee or independent contractor? And so it, is, is it a salary or what? what's that situation look like that you've been, that's worked yeah. for your clinic? I've, I've refined it over the years um, a lot. And so it's different. So it basically um, what, what it was then and it had been for many years is like a base salary that you could like live off of. And then from there, we would, you would bonus up and your salary would go up based off of the volume and what you were seeing. And so um, I don't remember the exact number of patients in my head. I thought you know, they had to see to be able to, I think it's like five. So like bringing on other associates now or other APRNs and that kind of stuff in my head, I'm like, they should be able to cover their basic, you know, I'm not trying to make money off of them in the beginning. I'm not, not that you want to make money off of like your associates, but you do like, right. Like the idea is that you can do other things and like pull other resources. Um, so I'm in the beginning, I'm just they're, like, they're breaking even but they're adding value and mm-hmm. seeing the value in that. So crunching a number of like, how many patients do you think your associate can see to break even malpractice, health insurance, whatever else you offer a time off, think about all those things and come up with a number. And if they need to see five, six patients a day or whatever the number is, if your cash would be different, have the, ba- then that could be their base. And then anything after that, you can figure out how much money to make off, like, like how much money you want to scale for them or whatever. Um, and so the numbers should work out that, you know, it works out like, I think like a lot of the other practices do. Um, but that base alley lets you breathe and learn your medicine. So you were talking about earlier, like the volume and does that impact quality? And I would say no, but I've found there have been points in the growth of my practice where I have been trying to stay in patient care more and do all the administrative things. And that, that can really be something like not dangerous, but painful and and not good for your practice is if you're super spread thin, your clinical skills are compromised with that and, and, or your ability to chart and all the other things, get back to phone calls and that will affect your quality. And so I've seen it a couple of times where like I was spread really thin and, you know, amongst all this, I had like a paraplegic dog. I had two kids. Like I've had life happening in the background of all this. And when you're spread really thin and like, you know, um, one case I can think of is like, I spent like 30 minutes explaining, or I was explaining adrenal fatigue to someone. She's like, yeah, I know we went over this last time. And I was like, right. <laughs> you know, you're like, I'm sorry. Like, yeah. you know, you like realize you're like, I'm going, I'm doing too much and making sure you're like keeping your plate max 80% full, like, because you need to leave that 20% for whatever's going to pop up in your business. Like, um, I don't know what I told you, like I, that we got hit by lightning two weeks ago at my office. Oh, geez. Uh, yeah. I, it's just like that kind of stuff will come up in practice and you have to be able to give yourself wiggle room. So don't, max yourself out on patient care and the other, like always give yourself some buffer rooms that you can like 
deal with the things that you don't even know are going to come up. You know, that, that was a thing I learned the hard way. Cause I just feel like I, it impact whenever I saw myself spread too thin and it was impacting patient care, the quality of care I like to give, I felt horrified by that. Cause I never wanted to see that slide, you know, what, what was your solution? I guess how, how, what, what, yeah. What was the solution you came up with to have that kind of balance? Like did, and now are you lean more towards, you know, you're focused on business or you're focused on patient care? Like what, what have you found to be working for you? So, um, I've seen my job, like, you know, I've reframed my job in our community is like, my job is to help my associates thrive and flourish. Like that is my job. And my job is to set them up for success, education, support, whatever they need technology. So the past year, one of the articles I read on burnout was on like, um, one of the ways to prevent burnout or reduce burnout is to become a power user of your EMR. Everyone hates their EMR. No one likes their EMR. No one likes charting. No one demands the chart. But if you like become like a power user of your EMR and it can do a lot of things, they're, they're really powerful and they're designed to make our jobs as easy as possible. Most of us don't access all the cool things in it. And if you do, it reduces the burden on the doctors a lot. So that's been my, my challenge the past year is like, instead of going to fun conferences, I've been going to like EMR conferences and medical business management conferences um, because I want to make stuff. I want to make my team have less work and make more money. That's my goal right now is to help my physicians thrive. And I want to still see some patients because I think seeing patient care reminds me of what we're doing and why. And I also love my patients. I've had them for forever now, you know? So, um, I see patients, uh, like one or two days a week. And so I really limit it to like maybe 20 something patients a week, max, um, probably even a little less than that, more like 15. And, um, then I'll also, it's, I'll also put in like admin weeks once in a while where I'll block out a, some days here and there just to like also do extra catch up. It started, um, when I started, I was five days a week. And then it was my associate who was like, could we go to four days a week? And I was like, oh yeah. You know, so we cut back and that one day off to like get caught up was like a godsend, you know? Um, so I think scheduling blocking time really made a big difference. It's the long answer to that question. Yeah, no, I, I, and I feel like, uh, yeah, I've seen like variations of that in, in different practices. Once you, I think that's a dilemma for, you know, these successful practice owners like yourself, where, you know, you meet that crossroads where it's like, all right, do I, you know, do I focus on the business and growing this thing? But at the same time, like you're not necessarily ready to kind of remove yourself from patient care altogether. And I feel like you're not the only one that goes through that. I feel like I've, you know, I've seen several docs kind of hit that crossroads and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it sounds like your, your, your focus is primarily on the business side. Um, do you have like, do you have a skilled operator in place, like a, a manager in the practice that's kind of like, like, and, and when, when did you bring that person on? And like, like, what does that kind of look like? You know, cause I imagine like, cause you can't do everything because you are still dabbling in, in both sides of the business. Right. And so it's like, well, the fix would be either I get out of that completely and I be the vision, I'd be the CEO of this company. Um, or I continue to do patient care, but I get an excellent, you know, other CEO or operator in place that can absolutely like run that part. I found too that like I have a vision of things that I want a certain way. And so I haven't been able to like completely let go of like, so I have, I have two right hand women who uh like one does like the payroll and HR and the 401k and the healthcare and the back end piece of things. And then like, um, you know, we'll take on projects on the back end piece of things. And then I have a office, so we call her an office administrator and then I have an office manager that like is in charge of like, who's the receptionist in West Hartford today. And like, you know, who's out, who's not, where is everyone going? The patient complaints, what else does she do? She does like everything. So like um, helping with the dispensary if they need help or 
whatever. Like she's at the billing meetings with me. I'm trying to think of that, like that kind of stuff. Um, and then we kind of all pivot around going to the weakest link and that kind of thing. So I brought my first one on, who's now my office administrator. Um, she came on with me when it was the four of us. And there were a couple permutations before I landed with her. Um, and it, it was basically my one associate was like, you need an office manager. You need an office manager. And I was like, you're right, you're right. No, no, I can do it all. I can do it. He's like, no, you can't. Because I was thinking my receptionist could be my office manager, but they can't. They can't. Um, they're a different breed of people and they require a different salary, but they are completely worth the investment. So it was around four where I was like, if I take this off my plate, I could either see more patients if I'm worried about the money or keep focusing on growing the business, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so you came to the, that decision and then brought her on, brought yeah. on the office manager. Yeah. Um, real quick, I I, I want to touch on just the marketing piece really quick. Um, when you scaled, when 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 you started getting you know these waiting lists for patients and stuff, what was the biggest driver of new patient growth? Mm. You know, because at some you know I know you're still doing all the community outreach, all that stuff. Um. But like after a while, I mean, it, what would you say is compounding that patient growth the most? You hit a certain number, they grow themselves. Too. Okay. Yep. So that's, referrals. Yeah. So like once you get that good, like, and that's why the quality is something you really want to be mindful of all the time, be on top of, because your biggest referral is your patient base. I have never done the like, um, you should bring your family members in. And like, I've never done the like, Hey, if you send someone here, I'll give you whatever free, but I, I've never done any of that stuff. What I will do is if I do have like five minutes extra, I may be like, Hey, how's your sister doing? Cause I know they are going through this and that, like, you know, you should consider this or like giving like a little hints at like, Oh, I treat that too. Kind of thing. So, um, the quick and dirty of a lot of the, how I would break down marketing or uh, community outreach is passive and active. I and mean, you probably have gone over this stuff and know it way better than me, but like, I would have like passive flyers in my waiting room, passive flyers out in the community, and then um, actively doing lectures. And so, and then you basically can do internal and external market like outreach, right? So you've got your patient base that you can be doing emails, newsletters, educating them about what they do, what you do, because it's amazing how many people are like, oh, you do, you could have tested me for that. And you're like, yeah, I could have tested you for that. We did that here, you know? Um, and so educating your patient base on what your clinic is and then educating the community on what your clinic is. And then doing the same thing, both actively with, uh, you know, webinars, Facebook lives or um, lectures or whatever. And then you could also do it passively with just newsletters and things that I can live forever kind of thing. Podcast was my new one. Um, yeah. so I'm always, I always divide everything out into internal, external and passive and active, and then have aim for two or three things happening at once in all of those categories. Yeah. Um, and it sounds like, yeah. And it sounds, I think that's an important piece is like, it sounds like it's, that's been a constant, um, task in your growth like it there, you you have not put the brakes on marketing in like yeah. You, yeah it's just an ongoing thing whereas like i've seen some other docs kind of like we have a lot of traffic we're busy and then they kind of like slow down the the marketing funnel and then it's and then things dry up and then they have to turn it back on and it's like no you're continuously doing those things um again with the idea that it's outreach it's not marketing. It's just part of our values. It exactly. Just I love that. So we're sponsoring a triathlon tonight and we'll have a little table there. And it's like, it's not, it's to support. I mean, am I going to get patients? I don't even know. It's just showing up for the people doing this triathlon or whatever, you know, they, that kind of thing where it's like, it's just part of our core values that we do that. Um, and so then that is part of what got me. So I'm, the hospital brought me on at, and changed their bylaws so that I'm medical staff there now. And um, there's been a lot of change and the, the hospital is about to become, so I, that happened in 2018. And I did like two inpatient contact, uh, uh, like, like a few like consults in the hospital before COVID. And then I was like, now nah, I'm good. Man. I don't need to be going to the hospital right now. 
but so how am I adding value to the hospital and how am I staying on their radar? So I'm like, there's a, I'm listed as medical staff. There's a little picture of me. I've got a badge and actually a handful of like five or six of the doctors do the NDs do too in my office. Um, and what was interesting is the reason they are, I'm still adding value and they still are keeping me in the hospital, even though I'm not doing patient care is because of the patient education and the outreach piece of things. So I'm on the committee to like help with the hospital's patient education. And they look at all these crazy metrics with it. And any of the lectures that the NDs touch, we max out their Zoom. We have like butts in the seats. People are super interested in it. And then like when like, you know, the nephrologist comes to talk about kidney disease, no one's showing up for those ones, but they want to hear about like, what is a ketogenic diet or why would I intermittent fast or how else can I lower my cholesterol? They want that. So the um, CMO said, he's like, you know, we're watching these metrics and like realizing that the demand is on you. And so the hospital is seeing the value there, which is really cool too. So it's like, it's not, it's, if you just go with the mindset of like, we're in a service industry and some of the service you're going to get paid for. And some of the service is part of why we're on the planet to help each other, you know? Yeah. Um, wow. I, that's, yeah. that's really neat. Um, it's like, yeah, you're, cause all the patients in that network are tired of the same. They're probably, you know, they're exhausted by the same old thing it's like, it's time for reinvention in that sector. Right. And it's like, you're bringing that. And so that's, <laughs> that's the attraction for, for the people wanting to tune into your, your messaging and stuff like that. I like that. Yeah. I will That's say cool. this. Yeah. So there's this, um, there's this program in Connecticut. I don't know if they have in other places where like for women businesses, they'll do like, they have a lot of resources to help support um, women in business. And so the one, they would do like a free audit of my marketing. And so they came in and like looked at me online, looked at me without knowing what I was doing. And I showed them what I was doing and they did like a whole report and then they were going to give you advice on like, where are your weak spots? What you should be working on? Like my brand, what should I like all this kind of feedback. And the feedback they gave me was you're doing, you should stop marketing, stop putting money into it, stop doing it. And you're like, why? And they're like, they're like, you've got plenty. And you're like, that's not the point. Cause honestly, even if like, it's not me, if it's just feeding naturopathic medicine more, like I don't want to just if you aim past wanting enough patients to being like, I want everyone to know my brand. I want everyone to think like, I don't know, is vitamin C good for that? Let's look it up on Lauren's website. Like that, that kind of, I want us to be uh, a knowledge base for the community and a resource in that way. That's so much more than just patients. And if you can shoot the vision higher, um, the patients are going to be, a, are going to come with it. You know, if you're in, if you're in a place of service, m the money will flow there, you know? Yeah. don't over give and don't, you know, spend two hours when you're supposed to be spending a half hour, you know, control your time and take care of you through that. But yeah. yeah. But I, I like that. Cause that's something I have mentioned before is like 10, 10 X in your efforts. Right. It's like, because even if you fall short, you're still going to probably achieve what you were originally set out to, to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. Also, it sounds like that marketing company was wanting to, <laughs> trying to create uh, turn you into a, a client of theirs <laughs> like i know completely but i was also interested that they told me yeah they right they were gonna have me stop everything and all yeah and be like oh you need our help now yeah <laughs> no, that's, that's hilarious um all right well i, I know we're we're going a little over time here it, i i want to just a quick version from how you took you know this one clinic you're you're in now which is like head we could call it headquarters probably uh okay. and then how you you know how you open up the second one third one fourth and I'm, i don't even know how many do you even have yeah what? uh so we're opening we, we just opened one like a month ago and we're opening up another one this fall so five or six i don't know yeah um so we so I'll, I'll jump you really quick so we had mine in manchester um there was a lot of interest um in uh the other side of connecticut's divided by a river and so like for whatever reason it's like hard to drive over the river for people it's not, but, and so uh, we jumped over to across the other side of the river as our first satellite. And we started in an acupuncturist office, kind of like I said, like, you know, tipping our toes in the water of this a little bit. And so we just had some of the doctors going over there here and there. Um, and that's kind of how we did some of the other ones as well. Like out of another clinician's office, one of the doctors would be there and then we kind of build it from there. Um, and then um, the, the other one that we started last year, that's a bigger one, um, which is probably like 
a little under half the size of, of the main headquarters. Uh, we was space. We were running out of rooms. Like this is, you know, I literally was seeing patients like in the, the parking lot sometimes. <laughs> like wow. you're like, I just, yeah. so um, it was a space issue. And so we've kind of planted like half the team over to this other office. That's just a town over, and yet it pulls a different patient base. Um, so it was, and mostly driven by the doctor's interest in living in different places um, for the further clinics. And then um, the closer ones, there's like three that are kind of in, encompass um, Hartford. Those have been like our main hubs that are, it was just, um, expanding into areas where you looked at the, at the demographics of your patient base and going like, okay, well, there's a big chunk from over here we could pull those ones automatically in so that would cover our overhead and then anyone else we bring in is gravy kind of thing. So it's really about mining the data out of your database, which comes back to my first job, right? Like, um, and understanding like, this is my, this is my patient. This is my metric. Like, this is what we're looking at. This is our demographic. And this is kind of what we could be doing to serve these people more, um, in this area is that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah. Yeah. And then, and it's, then it's, sorry, go ahead. I was just saying, and then starting at like a small scale first initially versus like putting a large upfront investment in it. Cause it's like, you're, you're kind of taking the approach you took from the very beginning where let's just get in in a small space, rent and like grow it that way. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, all the phones go through one, through the headquarters, all of the messaging goes through the headquarters, the EMR is in the clouds that. All right, guys. So it looks like we have. Oh, there we go. Oh, okay. okay. I was like, we disconnected there for a bit and yeah. I was chatting with everyone listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I uh, basically having everything as much as possible be on a cloud so that you can scale it easily is another mm -hmm. key thing. So our phone systems, everything, which was a product of, um, you know, the pandemic as well as like, you know, everything our voice over IP phone system, everything can be at home or it can be here. It can be anywhere. So it's easy to bounce around. And then it is nice to be in a clinician's office because um, you have a backup. If like someone doesn't show to be a receptionist, there's another person there, that kind of thing, especially these ones that are further away. So yeah. Um, yeah. 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 It's been a wild ride. It's been like uh, fun to talk about. You don't really ever talk about your practice. Like, this. yeah, no, that's a, that's an incredible journey. And and I feel like we could probably spend another three hours talking about this, honestly. Like there's just so many finer details that go into it. But I, I feel like this was a, an incredible overview, um, the insurance portion and then just the growth and the reframing of marketing to community outreach. Like I love all that stuff. And um, one thing before, you know, we get off, I, I kind of I like to ask the guests, you know, what's that one piece of advice that you'd give? um uh, a new clinician or you know a student that's almost ready to graduate like what's that one thing that kind of stuck with you or that you learned along the way that's really been like your your focal point or your you know thing you took you, you learned the most from uh business wise or clinically? it could be any anything it, honestly like just anything um I think that the, the, I was at an AMP conference where the woman said like, your practice shouldn't look the same in five years. And that has stuck with me a lot um, where it's just like, you should be evolving. And the second, and that's actually one of my main criteria for hiring is what are you doing outside of the clinic? What are you into? What are you passionate about? Are you committed to learning and self-improvement? Like everyone's got their vices and like, unhealthy habits. I'm not, I don't care, but it's more about like, are you on a journey to improve because that and learn, because that is so key to a healthy practice is to be investing in improving yourself and learning and being, having that energy behind you. And I mean, like I said, at every point, there's definitely points in my life where I've had to like step back and not be able to focus completely on what I've wanted to. I've had to focus on something else, but that drive to improve um and letting yourself focus on for part of your practice should be 
self-improvement as a person or a clinician or both um, because that keeps you from getting burned out and that keeps this exciting. You know, if you're doing the same thing in 10 years, you're not doing it right. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, it's like uh, maintaining that level of curiosity that probably led you to this profession in the beginning, right? It's But but now it's translating to all aspects of your life and maybe, and your business, right? You have to be yeah. curious in business. Um, I love that. That, that yeah. was really great. Um, there's the but, one last quote. And I'll, yes, there's um, uh, Tim Allen's uh, Santa Claus 2, I believe, is the movie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Santa Claus is uh, burdened with some stressors at work. And uh, he was like, um, someone was like, oh, man, this must be really hard for you. And he's like, it, it's only a problem if it's at home. If it's If it's at work, it's a challenge. And so really, the other reframing you should do is it's a challenge. It's not a problem you can, it's something you can, it's a hurdle you can jump. You just have to like, look at it that way. And that makes a big difference to me too. So yeah, sorry. I'm giving no, lots of pearls. And, and I think that's been the key, like, as I'm listening to your story and kind of putting it together, I think that's one of the key aspects to your success is um, one, you're a go-getter, you're jumping into everything and anything, right? And part of that is that curiosity that, that drives you. Um, which I think, you know, we need that as entrepreneurs, as clinicians. Um, that's what makes success is like willing to just be the yes man when it comes to opportunities and all those things and creating opportunities for yourself with that eagerness. Um, and then uh, the the other thing was, um, I'm blanking. Um, I lost it. I lost it. I lost it. Um <laughs> Darn it. I totally well, lost it. Then, you know, That'll be for the sequel. That'll be for the, the next one. And I'm happy to come on if we want to do a deep dive on like, or some like other ways to get this information to other naturopaths on like, what are the other key codes to do? Or what are the other ways to like, like we talked about all these little tuck-ins that make insurance systems work. So there's lots of, I'm happy to, you know, this can be a part one of part two coming next time. Yeah, actually, I, I got it. It came to me. It came to me. The second piece was uh, seeing this journey as a game, right? Because you keep referring to it as a challenge. And it's like, you're just actively just playing that game, right? Like, it's just you're, you're enjoying it and you're seeing it that way. And it's, it's almost like there's not really a finish line in place for you. It's just like, this is an ongoing challenge and game. And I feel like reframing it that way, too, is, is has probably been helpful to your success um and, yeah. and if you see it that I mean, way go ahead oh yeah yeah yeah. i mean I, i'm not to say like for every like cool story like the oncologist that was like super nice and like wanted to feature me in uh, grand rounds at the hospital there have been a lot of other there's a lot of ugly stories on there i think the key is to like not look down at the potholes look down the road have a vision and some core beliefs that you want to serve and that's the key you know what i mean so it's not like it's always been smooth, smooth sailing for sure. It's just more about like focusing on the good stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, and exactly. building that, you know? Yeah. Yep. Cool. Awesome. Uh, last thing here, you know, if anyone wants to, I'm not sure if you're hiring or what that looks like, or maybe someone has a question uh, around the business or just your practice in general, like where can, what's the best way they can reach you? Um if you go to my website, ctnaturalhealth.com, and I do have to change the domain at some point. I also own collaborativenaturalhealth.partners. So um, either one of those domains, because we're out of Connecticut, and we're one in New York now. So um, then they, they can shoot me an email through that. Um, and that's my, my clinic in general. So collaborativenaturalhealth.partners. Cool. Perfect. Cool. All right. Well, Thank you for coming on the show. I mean, this has been awesome. Um, I'm sure everyone listening took away a ton of info. Um, I, I appreciate you. And I imagine we will have another conversation here soon. Um, I'm sad I'm not going to see you at the conference here coming up, but we will make it happen again maybe next year. <laughs> and maybe yeah. we'll have an in-person podcast. Who knows? But, I would uh, love that. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for coming on. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for everyone listening. Um, you, you're helping me with my phobia of talking in front of NDs. <laughs> right. <laughs> awesome. All right, guys, All right. we will see you at the next one.